The Secrets of Doctor Who is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about the hit BBC series, Doctor Who. And today we're discussing the 12th Doctor story, Robot of Sherwood. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. And Father Cory Stika. Hi, Father Cory. How's it going? Very well, thanks. People, uh, folks, uh, make sure to follow The Secrets of Doctor Who in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, uh, iHeartRadio your favorite podcast app, or at the StarQuest YouTube channel, where you should also hit the bell to make sure you get notifications of new episodes. Stick around to the end of the episode. We have more of your listener feedback. And I want to tell you about another show on the network that you're sure to enjoy called The Secrets of Stargate. Check it out at sqpn.com slash stargate or wherever fine podcasts are found. So, Jimmy, could you give us a recap of Robot of Sherwood? Clara has always wanted to meet Robin Hood, and she uses a Name Your Destination trip opportunity to get the doctor to meet, uh, to take her to meet him, even though the doctor doesn't believe that Robin Hood was a real historical figure at all, and he's being a real jerk about it. When they arrive, Robin Hood seems to be real, but that doesn't stop the doctor from being an insufferable jerk who is convinced that Robin Hood must be a robot. Partly, that's because the Doctor and Clara discover that a spaceship from the 29th century has crashed in Sherwood Forest and has disguised itself as a castle to blend into the local scenery, kind of like it's got a chameleon circuit or something. Mm. Um, The spaceship is crewed by robots, and they've made a deal with the Sheriff of Nottingham to make him King of England and the world. And so that's all great, but their ship is damaged and they need gold to repair it. However, as they're taking off, the doctor realizes they are a few ounces short of the (laughs) amount of gold they need to make it into orbit, and so they will turn into a bomb that will destroy half of England. Robin Hood, Clara, and the doctor thus cooperate to fire a single gold arrow into the ship And this completely implausibly gives the ship enough gold to make it into orbit before exploding, thus saving England and the timeline. The end. (laughs) Yeah. I'm not sure much more needs to be said besides that, but Uh, we will. (laughs) All I I can say is, you know, as far as Doctor Who episodes go, it was certainly one of them. Yes. Yes. I mean, that's about all you can say about it. (laughs) Well, it's like... yeah. This is by Mark Gatiss again, and mm-hmm. so it's more British nostalgia. I was going to say, you know, like a lot of Mark Gatiss episodes, Mark, you know, and he's you know the writing partner of Stephen Moffat. There is funny elements, funny lines, some cute banter. No banter. I hate banter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the cute banter, mm-hmm. but the, as a whole, it just is kind of meh. You know, it yeah. just it, yeah. I I think I I need to do more investigation or I and over time I I will hear more of Gatus's solo writing but it look cuz he's done a bunch for big finish mm-hmm. but um my impression is that he's a really smart guy and he's at his best when he's not on his own mm. um a lot of the stuff with Sherlock that he did that he co-wrote with Stephen Moffat is really really good Oh yeah and so he, he clearly can do good work, but I find that at least on televised Doctor Who, when he's writing a solo script, it's I'm I'm very frequently just kind of meh about it. Yeah. Underwhelmed. And that applies to this episode. Yeah. It's just kind of silly. It was kind of fun, but that's about all you can say about right. it. I, I wonder if part of it is because we're Americans, because even though we grow up hearing about Robin Hood and maybe see a Disney movie where he's portrayed by an animated fox or something, <laughs> Robin Hood isn't part of our culture in the same way. And so I wonder if we're not appreciating this as much as folks in the UK would, because it isn't our history so much, um, because this episode is clearly meant to be nostalgic and funny. Mm-hmm. 
and it's just not. And I'm wondering if it, we're just missing missing part of this. I was a big Robin Hood fan as a kid. I read books. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I watched the movies. Errol Flynn, Robin Hood was one of my favorite movies as a kid. Mm-hmm. I mean, and even that, it still kind of falls a little flat for me. I mean, there's elements in it that are good, but yeah, I, I'm not even sure whether it even, you know, for, I mean, I, I want to hear from our British listeners, you know, if it, if it lands differently for you, but I'm not even sure it, it'll land the same way for them either. It, it just, it's, I, I mean, again, like it's a, it's a bunch of kind of funny little bits strung together into a, a loose, a plot, you know, that just doesn't quite work logically. I mean, there yeah. there are clear comments about how, you know, Nottingham in the fall, you know, it's, it's being sunny and warm and in the, the, yeah. the, you know, grass or the trees are green, which of course we understand that, but, but, you know, like the, the regional cult or regional weather patterns and so on are things we wouldn't get. But yeah, I, I, I don't know if this, I mean, maybe like you said, Jimmy, maybe this is a, a cultural thing that we don't get, but it just seems like a, not, a, a very nostalgic, not really that great episode. I mean, just that's mm-hmm. really how it hits me in general. Yeah. But I think part, part of, of it also is the, mm-hmm. is the 12th Doctor's personality in this is just so yes. out of character, like literally out of character. Like at one point, Clara says to him, when did you stop believing in everything? You know, as she asked the Doctor. And that's the point where I said, you know what? If this was a story set with the 9th, 10th, or 11th Doctors, or... Most of the classic doctors, it would he would be delight in the fun of mm-hmm. prancing around in in you know old England and 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 you know bantering with Robin Hood and we would just be excited about it. And this doctor's just grumpy about it, and it it just seems I don't know it seems off. It doesn't mm-hmm. seem right. Even for the eleventh doc or the the twelfth twelfth doctor, this does not seem like in character. He's he's extra grumpy in this, yeah. and yeah. I I have a. Th- theory about what could be causing that now the part the sort of the initiating thing that sets him off in this episode is the idea of robin hood himself he's just convinced robin hood is a fairy tale he does not exist blah 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 we're going to go to sherwood forest and see no robin hoods and then of course they do and so two points about that the first point is Actually, the historicity of Robin Hood is debated. Um, mm-hmm. there, there were lots of people. Actually, Robert, which its diminutive form at the time was Robin. But uh, Robin was a very common name in this period. And there were people with names like Robin Hood or Robin Hod or things like that. And some of them were criminals and some of them were in the right time frame and some of them are in this part of the country, and so we may have an abundance of Robin Hoods, and mm-hmm. the legendary figure that we're familiar with could be based on one of them. So the like King Arthur, the idea that there actually was a Robin Hood is not to be dismissed, right? and the Doctor is way too dismissive of it. But notice what else happens, you know, with him going, well, there's not going to be any Robin Hoods when we get there, and when they get there, He's he's declaring victory after looking at, at a small spot of the woods and saying, see, no Robin Hoods. And then, you know, immediately he's he's upstaged by Robin Hood shooting an arrow into the TARDIS, mm-hmm. which then heals itself. Mm. But notice notice what that does is it makes the doctor look foolish in comparison to Clara. Mm-hmm. And they then um, play that theme out through the rest of the episode. Where even though Robin Hood at first seems, you know, I don't know, friendly and, you know, like you like would be a good person to know, but then he becomes insufferable too. Right. By the by the time that they're all captured. And so the doctor and Robin Hood are out insufferable in each other, and Clara is telling them to shut up, and she's the sensible one who is taking charge of the situation and organizing it and making them at least roughly behave and make positive contributions. And all of that elevates Clara over the Doctor and Robin Hood. And then they make it explicit when they have this servant, this guard, come in and say, yes, I was listening at the door because the sheriff wanted me to find out who of you is the real leader. 
And of course, Robin Hood and the doctor immediately think he's talking about them in mm -hmm. such a cliched mode of writing. But no, of course, he's talking about Clara. And so he takes Clara off to be interviewed by the sheriff as the real leader. And all the way through this, this we're magnifying Clara over the doctor and Robin Hood. And so partly that can, um, I guess, even though it, it, I, it's too, really too early for this, I don't think that they had in mind, in fact, I know that they didn't have in mind the doctor gets, uh, Clara gets too big for her britches and tries to become the doctor leading to her death plot. Mm -hmm. that, that's something right. that's seasons away. So this is too early for that. I mean, it is consistent with that, but it's too early for that. Having said that, there is one I did like early in the episode where Clara is talking to Robin Hood and she is asking him about things and being giddy with delight as he describes things that she knows from the legend. And she keeps tipping her hand that she has more knowledge than she should. And Robin Hood is like, so very quick, how does the doctor stand it? And I like that as an acknowledgement that of a companion flaw that Clara can be a little insufferable too. Right. You know, one of the things that I feel like this episode was trying to do was trying to show the doctor as rejecting the, the label of hero, of, of being her heroic yeah. himself. You know, right at the beginning, he says old fashioned heroes only exist in old fashioned storybooks. He rejects fairy tales. At one point, Clara even, you know, calls him a hero, and he just bristles at that and rejects it. Like, he regrets, like, he doesn't see himself as heroic anymore, that, that he yeah. sees his own flaws or something. This is part of his am I a good man mm -hmm. theme that mm -hmm. they're working at this point. And it also could be conceived of as an early precursor of his apparently suicidal tendencies in this in this incarnation because remember at the end it takes a it takes meeting the first doctor to convince him not to die right after he's just been given a whole new cycle of regenerations first time out the gate and you want to die really right like, <laughs> right and they never they never explain that adequately right what is it about the 12th doctor that re that has turned him this way why, why is he so you know, re rejecting of himself as past as, you know. I mean, yeah, it, it's not like he just fought a time war or something. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Like in the Ninth Doctor, it would make sense. Although to come right out of the gate with the 2005 reboot of the series with this kind of Doctor would have really been the death knell yeah. of the series. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's for sure. So as you mentioned, they, they run into Robin Hood right off the bat. Um, he, he tries to take the TARDIS. Says and of course, all, they have the, to they have to show him in, in the pose where he's holding the bow and looking all you know heroic right. and you know in in the goofy green outfit that you know you, know, you see from the old uh, movies Aeroplane. and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is I think intentional. Try it's trying oh, yeah. to try trying to convey that maybe it is all a put on, maybe it all is a, a, a an act by somebody. Um, and then you know the dar says, "This is my property of the TARDIS," and he says, "All property is theft," which is a weird like. Robin Hood as a socialist kind of thing. Yeah, that, that even <laughs> isn't even part of the Robin Hood theory. It's more of you know the the rich are taking advantage of the poor, and that's why he stole from right. them. Not that they can't have property. Not that uh, yeah, that uh, he's a hard leftist. <laughs> <laughs> also, the Doctor is pretty loosey goosey on his understanding of property here because that TARDIS <laughs> he stole it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, maybe he's had it for so long that he, he it's now his, his but yeah. Squatter's claim right. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and let's, let's be honest, we already know from, you know, the, the doctor's wife that the doctor is owned by the TARDIS. So, I mean, it's the other way yeah. around. <laughs> right, that too. Um, then we have uh, the, the classic battle on the log, this log that is quite uh, wide and stable for a log that has fallen across a stream that looks more like a bridge, like, frankly, because that's the, what it is. <laughs> the prop masters built it for the set. Um, I interpreted it as a bridge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was it was fairly wide. I, I think that to, to give um, Capaldi a nice uh, steady surface to walk on. But of course, and it's sword versus spoon. And of course, the doctor wins because that's you now that he's the doctor. He has to win. Um, we get uh, this scene also of. These, um, the robot knights, the robot, they're really men at arms. They keep calling them knights, but they wouldn't be knights. They would be men at arms. But, uh, mm -hmm. the robo men at arms, uh, raiding a village for laborers. I'm thinking, 
in feudal times, if they needed labor at the castle, they just told the serfs to come to the castle, right? I mean, that was just that part of the deal. That yeah. was the deal, right? So I don't know. They just had to show them being bad. Yeah. Also, uh, there's an interesting moment in this scene. So they're 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 getting this younger woman who is described in the credits as Quail's ward. Mm -hmm. So she's apparently not his daughter. Mm -hmm. um, but the guy Quail certainly acts. He's an older guy, and he certainly acts like her father. And he wants to be taken to the castle instead of her. Now, presumably, they're not coming back mm -hmm. from that castle because they're going to be worked until they drop. Mm. Um, and so they may know that, and that may be why they're not coming to the castle voluntarily. Right. Okay. So that could make sense. But like when, when Quail is resisting having his ward taken, they like grab him and he spits in the Sheriff of Nottingham's face. And I was a little startled by the nature of the spit take. Because if you actually spit in someone's face, it's this little blob of stuff that comes out and hits them on the face. But instead, they have this, he had this enormous spray <laughs> yep. of he stuff. He took a mouthful of water first. <laughs> exactly. And I was thinking, I wonder why they did that. Because, um, because it doesn't look realistic. And I thought, well, maybe it's a safety thing, mm -hmm. because if you put like a mouthful of liquid and then spit it at somebody, today there could be, this wouldn't have been the case in the past, but today there could be health concerns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, this was, of course, pre-COVID, but still, um, you know, bloodborne transmission and spitborne transmission and things like that were on people's minds when this was filmed. And so I thought maybe he's not spitting. Um, maybe he's not spitting water. Maybe he's spitting alcohol mm. or something mm -hmm. else that, by its nature, is disinfectant. So you put it in. You fill up your mouth with the disinfectant, and you spit that, and it shouldn't bring any germs over from your mouth. Uh, so you might also do some little camera trick where they actually had some little sprayer kind of yeah. attached to the side because yeah. it's a side profile. So they could have had like some mm -hmm. little sure. sprayer, remote control sprayer that you know. I mean, it could be something as simple as that. He's just making the action like he's spitting, and it's all just post-production, yeah. too. I mean, it could be the uh, actors, the recipient, you know, the the sheriff Ben Miller um, mm -hmm. didn't want to be spat on, <laughs> by, yeah. by someone else either, <clears throat> and it's demanded like just a mouthful of water would be, uh, by the uh, way, acceptable. Speaking of Ben Miller, and Jimmy, you might have noticed this too. He could very easily play a recreation of the Anthony Ainley Master. I was. Just about to say Very that. Very similar yeah. facial features. He looks like the Anthony Ainley master with longer hair and a longer, you know, scruffier beard. Mm -hmm. You know, but he yeah. could totally very could easily recreate that master. And I'm not the only one who knows yeah. this. Actually, I found a website, warpedfactor.com, from when this episode first aired. And they even pointed that out, that, like, this, this guy is obviously channeling Anthony Ainley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who even was, uh, was King John. So, yep. uh, so the sheriff of Nottingham and King John are both the master. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I totally would have. I uh, was saying that he looks like the master, and if they hadn't already got Missy in the in the mix, this would w it would have been awesome to bring him in in this season Which, as as the master. That would that would, that would have been cool. Have a, a Missy and and Anthony Ainley master two parter yeah. or something. Yeah, mix them and, up. And because people will say that I missed it if I don't say something out loud, I'll say it out loud. <laughs> yes, I also thought he looked like the master. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you don't say it, it didn't happen to you. Exactly. Um, no, no, no. It's more than that. If you don't say it, you missed it. You didn't know about it. Right. That's right. true. That's true. So um, we, we, we now credit you. Um, so the, the like you mentioned, the doctor thinks it's all fake. Um, stop laughing. Why are you always doing that? He's very grumpy about the laughter. Um, but Clara recognizes that Robin is sad because he laughs too much, uh, which is kind of a little bit of a trope. But it's the whole so, Maid Marian thing. Yeah. So this is in the scene where they're at the hideout in the forest and the doctor is and Clara are talking to Robin Hood and the Merry Men. And as they're doing this, um, the doctor is surreptitiously performing tests on the Merry Men to try to see if they're human or not, because he thinks they're robots. Mm -hmm. And he like is plucking out people's uh, hair and scanning it with the sonic and doing all kinds of things to different Merry Men. And he comes up to Alan Adale, 
and we hear Alan and Dale say, ow, and then the doctor is like withdrawing a syringe from mm-hmm. his arm and says, blood check, and then he looks at it and says, all those diseases, if you were real, you'd be dead in six months. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Alan Adele says, I am real. And the doctor says, bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was good. I like but that. Th- that, was, yeah. that was really nice. And Peter Capaldi's delivery, which is better than mine, it's just it, blood check. And then <laughs> he, this genuine shock of all those diseases. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, the, I have to say, like the 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 various interactions here, where he steals Fire Tuck's uh, sandal. This isn't real. And then smells it. Oh, <laughs> no, it this, is. <laughs> this is not a sandal. And Fire Tuck says, "Yes, it is." And the doctor looks at it. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was uh, there was a lot of uh, good good fun stuff here, including the I, no bantering. I hate banter. Um, There's also a callback in this scene all the way back to the third doctor, which people, it goes by kind of quickly. So if you haven't seen the episode, it, it, it may not register, but he's trying to explain what could be responsible for this fake Sherwood Forest with this fake Robin Hood and Merry Men group. Yep. Mm-hmm. And at one point he says, or we could be in a miniscope. Right. And that that's a callback to Carnival of the Monsters yep. or Carnival of Monsters with John Pertwee's doctor, where he and Joe Grant do go into a miniscope, which is a kind of device. It sort of it sort of culturally fills the role of one of those um like nickel peep show machines. Mm-hmm. That people had back in the early 20th century where, you know, you, you put a, a nickel in and you watch a little movie. Crude animation. Um, yeah. Crude yep. animation. Yeah. yeah. Um, but except it's real. It's more like a holodeck or it's like a little world in there. Mm. And you can have drash eggs and other monsters and it's uh, fantasy environments. Yep. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. And so he was re- calling back to that. Okay. Um, so then we have the classic, if you're going to have Robin Hood, you have to have the scene where they have the, the arrow shooting contest. I mean, this is pretty much everything of this era. They, they're always shooting, having arrow, con- uh, archery contests. And, uh, we have the, the, well, this one, they have Robin Hood as Tom the Tinker, which is actually in the original stories. Um, but he's against the sheriff. Like in, they would never have had, have had him uh, against the sheriff in those. But, um, they're splitting arrows. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, they shoot the target, and then uh, Robin Hood shoots it and splits it down the middle. You know the impossible shot. The sheriff's shot. arrow. Yeah, yep. the sheriff's arrow. And then, of course, the doctor shows up and does it too. And then um, they they start going crazy. Like uh, he shoots it by ricocheting off one of the men at arms, his armor, and uh, shooting without looking. And and so you get this idea, like, oh, and, the doctor. And each and so you have this this arrow splitting contest where everyone yep. keeps splitting everybody else's arrows. Right, and you know, you, you, I like the fact that they kind of play off of the whole the doctor is always super competent at everything by later on revealing that the doctor was cheating that he had mm-hmm. homing arrows, which mm-hmm. is actually I, I I'm really glad that they did that that we kind of put a little uh, hole in the doctor's uh, uh, mm-hmm. big ego and reputation. There, there also is a line in there where the doctor hangs a lantern on what's going on during the arrow splitting competition and says, this is getting silly. And I'm going, yeah, you think? <laughs> and, then, and, and then he, uh, he ends it by using the sonic screwdriver to cause something to explode. The homing arrow. Well, the arrow, I, the target, or whatever, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something, yeah. But... Um, Okay, we don't normally see the sonic causing explosions, but mm. whatever. Especially the last, in the, the yeah. Middle Ages. I was going to say we did in the third Doctor when he blew up landmines, but... <laughs> right. well, <laughs> but not in, not in the Middle Ages. There's yeah, not right. as much stuff I, you could cause to silly. explode. There was yeah. Nitro 9 in that last arrow. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, one thing I forgot to mention with the, uh, where the Doctor was battling with the spoon... Uh, against Robin Hood, it reminded me of the uh, the Robin Hood uh, movie with Kevin Costner, where you had uh, Guy, of G- Guy of Gisborne, um, and and uh, you had uh, what was his name? Uh, who played Snape? Alan Rickman's mm. mm-hmm. Sheriff of Nottingham, who mm. had threatened to like, I'll kill you by carving out your heart with a spoon. And later on, Guy of Gisborne says, "By the way, brother, why a spoon?" 
<laughs> because it hurts more, you knave, you fool. <laughs> And mm-hmm. I just love the fact that they brought a spoon into a Robin Hood thing. It, that's become a line in my house. And when someone asks for a spoon at the like at the dinner table, someone will say, "Someone will say, why a spoon?" And then mm-hmm. we all say together, "Because it hurts more." Mm. Um, so I just I wanted to appreciate that they brought a spoon into a Robin Hood. And I almost wonder if that would be a call, it was actually a callback to that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I what it made me think of because I haven't seen that movie, but what it made me think of was the Tick. Mm. Um, because the ticks battle cry was spoon. Oh yes, <laughs> that's what I haven't seen. So that's, that's funny. Mm. Uh, so we get the revelation that the uh, the, the, the sheriff d- demands that the robots, uh, you know, kill everyone and take them uh, prisoner. And uh, so we re- we we get the revelation that the men at arms are actually the robots with lasers in their foreheads, and uh, they start blowing everything up, including. All the people, like it just seemed weird, like just all the bystanders too. And uh, the doctor intentionally gets captured because, and it's a good line. Um, you know why? Well, the quickest way to find out anyone's plans is to get yourself captured and then you know interrogate them in reverse, basically. Yeah, I don't know that that's the case. No, but it's but it's a sort of trope, isn't it? Like getting you get captured mm-hmm. and then you get the uh, the bad guy to reveal it's, everything while he's monologuing. It's the I have them right where I want them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The um, not persuaded Um, because what (laughs) typically happens if you get yourself captured is they lock you in a room and leave you alone for a long time. Right. That's if you're if if you're interested in actually finding out their plans, there are better ways. Which which of course leads to the insufferable scene. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then we yeah so we get the dungeon scene where they're they're all tied you know tied up in on against stakes in the dungeon. Um, and we have this competition between the doctor and Robin to see who is more whatever. Um, and I, I do like the line where Clara tells him to, to, to be quiet and says, it's not a competition to see who could die slower. And then the doctor throws in afterward, but it would be me, wouldn't it? (laughs) Like like a little kid. Okay. Okay. But it would be me, wouldn't it? Like they had to get the last word. Yeah. Because he's a time lord, so he is vastly longer lived compared to humans. That's right. That's right. Um, and then we, as you mentioned, we had uh, Clara is seen as the leader, so she gets taken away to be interviewed by the sheriff, who reveals everything to her. Um, she flatters him to, you know, to get his story. Um, and we find out that they, the sheriff and the robots, like you mentioned, they only want gold. You know, even though they're they're raiding all the villages and taking all the stuff. Which is kind of interesting because it's sort of turning the Robin Hood thing on its head, right? Robin steals from the rich to give to the poor. Well, the 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 the, the I almost said the master, the sheriff is stealing <laughs> from everyone else in order to give to the robots. So it's sort of that idea. Um, and they discover the the spaceship, and uh, and they look at uh, in the data banks of the spaceship. They look at images of Robin Hood that are on file from different media and one of them is Patrick Troughton. Right. Because he was the first person to like play Robin Hood in on television back in the 50s. And so they've got an image of Patrick Troughton as Robin Hood in the databank. Right. Awesome. Right, right, right. That's funny. Um and then uh I wonder why the doctor doesn't say that guy looks familiar. <laughs> and yeah. uh it, there there is a line where the sheriff wanted to make Clara his queen when he took over England. Uh, it says, pity what a queen she would have made, which is a little ironic, given that Jenna Coleman would go on to play Queen Victoria in the series Victoria. So oh. I, thought, I thought that was mm-hmm. kind of funny. Um, mm-hmm. So we have the doctor claiming that the ship's radiation leak. This is explanation, and I'm trying to, I was trying to get it straight in my head, and I wasn't sure I got it. The ship's radiation leak has created a fake story to hide the fact of the ship and its leak, a castle, a climate, a bad guy in the sheriff, and a hero in Robin, that this is all a creation of the spaceship? Well, so the doctor proposes a theory like that, um, but he... It's a stupid theory. Yeah. And, and, and like he, for example, specifically with regard to Robin Hood, you know, they, they're creating this totalitarian microstate in order to extract the gold they need from from the area 
and so they can repair the ship. And um, and what do you need if you have people under an oppression? You need, according to the doctor, the illusion of hope. And so he thinks that the, that Robin Hood was created as a robot, even though all of his tests have said that he and the Merry Men are humans. He thinks that Robin Hood was, is a robot who was created to provide the illusion of hope to the locals. And later on, when this is explained, uh, it, when, when this is uh, discussed during the final confrontation, it's pointed out to, uh, to the doctor, I forget if it's by the sheriff or the by sheriff. Robin Hood himself. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, the sheriff. That's a stupid plan. If you're <laughs> if you're oppressing people, you don't want to give them hope. Right, yeah. right. And the doctor at that point acknowledges, yeah, that actually is a stupid plan. So it's all just <laughs> misdirection. Yeah. Uh, now, is the sheriff a robot? I was yes. reading some behind the scenes stuff that it was mm -hmm. supposed to be revealed he was a robot, and he didn't. So yeah, cause, so apparently. Now, what they say in the episode itself, in its televised form, is that he's a new breed of man, and he's part... He sounds like he's a cyborg, that he's yeah. part human and part robot. Um, and apparently, he was going to be decapitated, um, which would reveal that he's a robot or something. Mm -hmm. But a couple of ISIS terrorists or Islamic terrorists had just decapitated some, some people, and it was in the news. And so they cut that shot, and um, and so, and you can see where the cut was if you know what you're looking for. So apparently, I don't know if he was going to be a full robot or just a cyborg. If they're decapitating him and they and we don't see the head alive afterwards, then I would assume he would have to be a full robot, even though he may think he's a man or a cyborg. <laughs> But on the other hand, they could decapitate him and his head could still be functioning, and that would reveal that he's a cyborg. Okay. And then, yeah. Uh, it, it, and also... and that, that explains the title. I mean, it's called Robot of Sherwood, which is a, a deliberate play on Robin of Sherwood. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and that's part of the misdirection to make you think maybe Robin Hood is a robot. Um, but, uh, but, there's no singular, because they'd made that cut, there's no singular robot in this episode. There are a group of robots in the form right. of the men-at-arms. Right. But, um, but there's no one person that would explain, that would be the robot of Sherwood, and it was meant to be the sheriff. Right, that's right. Yeah, that makes more sense then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the title didn't really make sense unless it was Robots of Sherwood, but then you wouldn't have the play on Robin of Sherwood, which was an ITV series back in the 80s. Um, yeah. That they were playing off of. Uh, the sheriff does at one point uh, say, who will rid me of this turbulent doctor, which mm -hmm. I think is a it's play Henry on... The, Henry VIII's line about Thomas a Becket, who yeah. will, will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? Yes. Uh, Henry so the, who... the second. Henry VIII was yes. Thomas Becket. I thought I said Henry the second. You said eighth. Oh, well, I'm at second. <laughs> <laughs> so um, then uh, we have this uh, scene where the, the, the serfs rise up against their oppressors, uh, bouncing laser beams back using various dinner platters. dinner platters, which would not actually work unless they were polished to an extremely high degree. You, you notice the, yep. the, the, the perfect shininess of the gold platters? Oh, wait, they weren't. <laughs> um. And then we have the gold arrow that the doctor won, or Robin won. We're not quite sure who actually won Somebody that contest. Somebody won it. Somebody won. Uh, but at the Merry the Men contest. stole it anyways. Yes. <laughs> they picked it up anyways. Um, and as you mentioned, Jimmy, somehow shooting the golden arrow to hit the side of the alien sh ship will provide power to things. And this is, and they, well, the way they shoot it is so stupid. Um, <laughs> apparently, the doctor and Robin, who both are amazing archers, have been incapacitated in some way. And like Robin's arm has been injured in the fight or something. Yeah. And so what they do is the doctor, Robin, and Clara cooperate in shooting the arrow by lying down on the ground, pulling the bow back, and all three of them shooting it at once. As yeah. if yeah. that would not totally destroy their aim. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> but it gives yeah. them more power, and that's why they did it that way. Yeah. Yeah, and it hit, so it hits the outside of the ship, 
which then absorbs it and and those just those few ounces of gold allowed it to get up into orbit enough that it wouldn't destroy England when it blew. Yeah, it was a big boom in the in the uh, orbit. Yeah. Um, then we uh, wrap things up quite nicely with Robin giving Clara an archery lesson and the doctor saying goodbye and they're, them saying things about um, uh, stories of heroes and that sort of thing. And then as the doctor leaves, he gives Robin a gift of presenting Quill's ward, who actually turned out to have been Maid Marian, um, yep. who for some reason was living as a serf in, a, in the village. Well, and the whole, the whole ending scene is, is, is basically explicitly saying the Doctor is really Robin Hood. You know, Robin Hood, the Robin Hood legend is lived out in the Doctor or something along that lines. Yeah, the, um, so the, uh, Robin says, is it so hard to credit that a man born into wealth and privilege should fight the plight of the oppressed and weak too much to bear? Um, and, the, and then says, until one night he's moved to steal a TARDIS, fly among the stars, fighting the good fight, and explains that Clara told the stories. Um, so the, uh, and then the doctor says, I'm not a hero. And that's that re recall back to the, am I a good man, mm -hmm. um, stuff in his back background, which, which is like the most, who cares doctor who running theme ever. <laughs> right. Because we know he's a good man. Like we've watched yeah. doctor who for however long, you know, for at this point, almost 50 years, we, we know that the doctor is a good man. It's sort of a. Uh, why yeah. is he going through this crisis? Now, see, if you wanted to do that as a storyline, there are ways to make it work. Um, you, what you could do is have the doctor make a terrible mistake. And then in the wake of that, he can be scrutinizing himself about right. what were my motives? Why didn't I act the way I normally would? Am I actually a good man at all? And then you pay that out by having him do something really heroic, and he realizes, yes, I really am. That was just a one-time mistake. Um, it doesn't. It does. It's not reflective of what my fundamental character is. But they didn't do that. They just, for no reason, have him start wondering if he's a good man or not. I mean, they really, if they wanted to do it, they should have done something with the, you know, just immediately pre-regeneration of the eleventh Doctor making a horrible mistake. But of course they're not going to do that because they don't want to send out the eleventh doctor on a on a on a negative note. You know right. they, they don't want to take that chance. Um, well, or or it also can work if it's among the first things that Peter Capaldi does sure. as the doctor is a colossal mistake, like um, choking his companion. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. do it. Yeah. <laughs> and I think they actually. I think Stephen Moffat may think that he did this. Because in, in the first Twelfth Doctor story, we have him and the clockwork guy who, oh, yeah. and they're up, they're up in the house and either the guy jumps or the doctor pushes him. But we, and the implication is the doctor pushed him. Right. Um, but, but with plausible deniability. And so, so maybe Moffat thinks that's as obvious to the audience as it is to him. But no, you need that off-camera mistakes do not count, especially if you don't admit to them. Now, if you had a scene where the doctor said to Clara, I pushed him and right. I don't know if I'm a good man anymore, mm -hmm. that would work. But yeah. they didn't do that. Right. It's too subtle, too, yeah. It's too... He didn't, like, it, it's too much of a risk avoidance. He doesn't want to risk over tarnishing the doctor. So yeah, but it, admittedly, I'm kind of glad they didn't. I'm kind of glad they didn't get explicit on that because I could see them even doing where they have the scene. They could have the scene where the robot jumps and the doctor is now just grief ridden that he didn't do enough to stop it, and right. that's why he's not a good man. Right. Or even that he talked the robot into jumping. Yeah. And maybe that's why he's not a good man. E either way, it's just like, okay, that makes it even worse than if you yeah. just hadn't shown it in the first place. Right. All right. Anything left to say about this episode, Father Corey? So we have uh, our continued arc uh, of this episode. The Promised Land is on one of the computers mm -hmm. that the, the, where the robots were going was the Promised Land from the 29th century. And, of course, that's a callback to Missy and that mm -hmm. we will get paid out by the end of the season. Yep, that's true. Missed that. Uh, Jimmy? Um, so there are some interesting religious themes in this. Uh, when they're in the cell, uh, in the dungeon, 
the window into the dark dungeon is shaped like a cross. And so you have this, this cross as a glowing source of light in this cell, which is uh, interesting symbolically. Um, it also strikes me as unrealistic because nor it's a really narrow window in order to be a cross. Mm -hmm. And normally the function of those arrows was to, fi uh, those windows, really narrow ones, were to fire arrows out of. Right. So I don't think they would have typically been shaped like a cross, but it's, it's an interesting symbol there. I mean, a cross illuminating the darkness. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know that. I know that yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, also, Friar Tuck is, uh, is presented uh, positively, and oh, yeah. in Robin's absence, while Robin is in jail, Friar Tuck steps into his role as kind of like the, the temporary leader mm -hmm. of the Merry Men. Um, the, um, uh, there's this moment 12 minutes before the end where Clara and Robin have fallen into the moat and the doctor sees Robin Hood get Clara, uh, Clara out of the water and take her somewhere. He's like carrying her cause I guess she's unconscious. And then we have, once he gets her back to the hideout, um, he's suddenly, after all of this time being this jovial guy, super serious. Mm -hmm. And he's like, tell me everything you know about the doctor. And, and he, uh, and I think that what they're trying to do at this point is make us question Robin Hood about like, could he be a robot after all? Um, because he's suddenly very, very serious and trying mm -hmm. to pump Clara for information. But that doesn't really go anywhere, and I don't. I'm not entirely sure why they did that. Well, so at the end, he could say he could reveal that Clara told him all about the doctor. Yeah, you know. Yeah, but they didn't need to play it that way. Could he? Right. She wakes up from from her experience in the moat, and he says, "I really need to know about the doctor, or right. tell me what you know about the doctor." Right. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, Jimmy, I did a quick uh, Google search, and arrow shaped. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, cross shaped arrow slits. Are a thing. Are a thing. Okay. Yeah. Good. So, so, so those were those were uh, fairly common, I guess. Hmm. Um, I guess I, I guess I could even see a function for the for the crossbeam in them. It would give you a wider range um, to shoot the arrow from, mm -hmm. not just vertically but horizontally. Right. 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 And of course, not as much of a range as a great big gaping hole in the wall. But <laughs> those those would. Um, <laughs> Those would expose you to arrow fire, which yes. was the point of the tiny slit windows. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, and or people climbing through them would be the other the other danger. Yeah. All right. Uh, so that does it for our discussion of Robot of Shorewood. Let's uh, get to that listener feedback I mentioned. Uh, this comes from our episode two seventy five on the second Doctor story, Web of Fear. Uh, Doug's film and TV what a sticky on Sticky Wicket. The sticky <laughs> Doug's film and TV on YouTube says. I just want to say I enjoyed your podcast, and this story is one of my favorite Second Doctor stories. I do have a question. Have you guys heard of the independent Doctor Who spinoff story called Downtime? It yes, is the... I have it on the shelf behind me. <laughs> it is the unofficial sequel to The Abominable Snowmen and The Web of Fear. It has the Brigadier, Sarah Jane, Victoria, Professor Travers, and the introduction of Kate Stewart, and it also has the return of the Great Intelligence and the Robot Yetis. So that was in the uh, Great Dark period between mm -hmm. Classic Who and New Who, right? Yes. And, it's, it, and it was licensed to the extent that they got to use the Yeti and these subsidiary characters, but not the Doctor himself. Or even and mention were, the Doctor, right? It, yeah, I don't recall that. Okay. Um, but uh, there were several films that were made under, by fans under that kind of licensing arrangement, and Downtime is one of them. And they have some interesting stuff that was then later uh, picked up and considered canonical, like the existence of Kate Stewart. Stewart. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yes, thank you. You'll also, you'll, also, you'll also find Ace in some of those and um, the Third Doctor's first companion, the Third smart Doctor. one. Oh, uh, oh, Liz Shaw. Liz, Liz Shaw. Yes. Yeah, I, was, I think I was trying to come up with the actor's name and was knowing it was wrong. Um, <laughs> it's not, I, I'm trying, I know I want the character name. Yeah. Um, yeah, Liz Shaw. Um, she's in them as well. Is Downtime the one that is really bad? Or is... No, no, okay. I, not, it's not. The really bad ones are the ones with, um, with Colin Baker and Nicola Bryant 
as the mysterious stranger and Miss Brown. Mm. Oh, okay, okay. Those was, are th- the ones I've seen of that are horrible. <laughs> yeah, there was one I saw part of that was really bad. I don't think it was that uh, that one, but um, yeah, mm-hmm. we'll ha- I'll have to we'll have to go. It's on our list of of uh, you know eventual. We'll get to talk about the, uh, the those those sorts of ones that are the unofficial uh, sequels and the unofficial Doctor Who's from the Dark Period. Uh, so, but uh, thank you, Doug's Film and TV, for for bringing that up. Okay, we want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Doctor Who, including Will W., David W., Frank R., Meg S., and Adam G. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Doctor Who and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. And we'd also like to thank Victor Lambs, who edits the show for us. So that's it from us. What did you think of Robot of Sherwood, this 12th Doctor story? You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com or the Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page or send an email to doctorwho at sqpn.com or visit the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. We'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the fourth Doctor story, The Mask of Mandragora. Until then, Father Cory Stika... Thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Doctor Who. Thanks, Dom. And Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Doctor Who on StarQuest. And remember, history is a burden. Stories can make us fly. 